we ended up, I think, doing the right version of the show, which was a a really nice high budget um, uh, version that was very faithful to the manga without being a one-to-one copy. Because if you're doing a one-to-one copy, why? Hi, Steve. Welcome. Thank Hello. you very much for doing this Thank interview. You. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let's start with the questions, if you don't mind. Uh, my, my first question is, I'm curious to know, what was your first meeting with One Piece? On my first meeting, I was um, uh, I met with uh, Tomorrow Studios because they had uh, acquired the rights to the story and uh, the underlying uh, IP. And they were looking for someone to uh, write a pilot script for them, uh, to do a rewrite and to um, to run the show. And so I had a meeting with them and um, uh, hit it off and, and loved the material. And, and that was the beginning. That was four, a little over four years ago. But was that the first time that you have actually been uh, involved with the One Piece? Like were you a fan before or not? That was the first time I was involved. I was a fan before, but I hadn't really uh, dove in deep. I had read a, a couple of chapters early, um, but I really didn't understand the, the the true breadth and scope of the world. Uh, and so I very quickly got up to speed with the first hundred chapters and then was so taken. I just said, if there's a way to be a part of this, I, I've got to do it. And then, yeah. and then I kept reading. It's like, now I'm, I'm caught up to, I think, a, Chapter 1089. So it's a, uh, it's a commitment. You're close. You're close. So um, that, that, that's incredible. And what is exactly that drew you to the story of One Piece? Is there uh, something that uh, particularly resonates with you? I thought it was a, a wonderful combination, a very unique world, first off, which you don't see that often um, in under, in big fantasy um, uh, intellectual property and, and, comics and mangas, they're there, but they're they are hard to come by, uh, especially the really good ones. And so I was really taken with Oda-san's world. Um, and then the storytelling was so kind of simple and elemental um, about a, a boy who's following his dreams and who inspires other people to follow their dreams. I've always said that um, Luffy's superpower is that he gets other people to remember their dreams and to start following them again. And, you know, even more so than stretchy power, that is his, his superpower. Um, and it was such a, a important story, I thought, and, and such so simple and yet so profound um, that, you know, the combination of the action and the world building and the emotion was amazing. What were the main uh, challenges of adapting such a popular story and the story coming from such a different medium? I would say the biggest challenge was finding the balance. Um, that was the biggest from the get go with the writing, with what stories to tell and how to tell them and how to break them up over a season. Because obviously, when the manga was written, it was not with an eye toward an eight episode television season. And so um, I had to reframe that and kind of figure out okay, what's a good beginning, middle, and end to this season that has a really interesting storytelling, character arcs, emotion. Um, so it was finding that balance and then also the balance between, uh, the hardcore fans who love every moment and every minutia, you know, every detail and minutia, um, of one piece, but also how do we rope in new fans who have no idea what one piece is, who are saying, what, what is this crazy show with a pink pirate ship and a, a kid with stretchy powers? What's that about? And so the hardest thing, and still, I think the hardest thing is finding that balance between. You absolutely anticipated one of my questions because uh, from watching the show, uh, I got that impression that you had two goals. Uh, one was to make it good and enjoyable for people who don't know what one piece is. And the other one was to make One Piece fans happy enough that they don't show up in front of your door with pitchforks. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that One Piece has, I, I've worked on some some popular shows, nothing like the fan base of One Piece. Um, it is, uh, there. people are so passionate and they're so terrified of, you know, ruining their, their favorite uh, uh, manga that, uh, you know, I felt a huge sense of responsibility to that. Yesterday, I interviewed Emma Sullivan, and we was the director, was the director for yes. episodes three and four. And she yes. told me that everything that you put in the show had to be approved by a Chiro Oda first. So I'm curious here if there is something that uh, Oda Sensei initially was not happy about, 
but you fought for it because you believe it was good and the show needed it and ultimately you were able to persuade him. There were a couple of things that took some persuading. Um, and if there was something that Odesan was really, really unhappy with, we found a way to change it. Um, but there were some things that we that we tried and got into the show that initially he was a little uh, gun shy about. Um, one of those was moving up. We, we structurally moved a couple of things up that don't happen until much later chapters. And so one of them, for example, was bringing up Garp as a, a more present character in the first eight episodes, uh, bringing in Kobe, bringing in Helmeppo, and having that Marine pursuit be present and on the Straw Hats and on Luffy's tail almost from the get-go, from episode two. Um, it was a big change. And I thought it was something that we really needed in order to keep the stakes up and let it feel like it, it wasn't just a fun adventure where we were meeting um, different antagonists and different villains and, and pirates, um, but where there was an actual kind of presence, organized presence and fearsome presence that was behind Luffy and pursuing. So that was a big, that was definitely a big challenge. And another one was was pulling up Arlong um, because Arlong doesn't really come in until the Arlong Park chapters. But uh, one of the things that we that we did and were able to convince Odasan of was pulling Arlong up, introducing him early, taking him to Baratier and kind of swapping him with the Krieg storyline um, in a way to make Arlong our big bad of the first season, uh, which I think worked very well. On the other hand, can you share at least one idea that Oda absolutely shot down, but you wish it made it into the show? There were definitely some things that we couldn't do, and we were okay with most of those things. For example, one of the big mandates was no changing the backstory of how someone got a devil fruit uh, and, and the powers of the devil fruit. And so it was like, yes, we, we don't want to introduce new devil fruits. We don't want to um, uh, change things that are canon. We was always talking about canon and about how to service, uh, do fan service, but also service for Odasan himself. So definitely the devil fruit stuff, definitely keeping backstories as pure as possible. Um, and I, I would say it was it was it was really a process because we did several different versions of the story before we started writing it, certainly before we started shooting, some of which were a little further away from the manga and some of which were much closer. We ended up, I think, doing the right version of the show, which was a, a really nice high budget um, uh, version that was very faithful to the manga without being a one to one copy, because if you're doing a one to one copy, why? There's no reason. So you mentioned backstories, actually, uh, which is a good segue to my next question. So uh, this first segment of the One Piece story that you have adapted is mostly about introducing the stories, right? Yes. And uh, the manga uh, does it by, in a great way, I think, by giving each one of them one incredibly powerful moment that we fans still remember 25 yes. years later. Right, and these are moments that usually come after the flashback, and in which the straw hat essentially states who they are and what they're going to do from that moment yep. onward. Mm -hmm. So you managed to put some of these into the show, including my personal favorite moment of the entire series. Uh, no spoilers, but uh, folks, look out for episode seven because it's there. So okay. I wanted I wanted to ask. Uh, what is your personal favorite straw hat moment and backstory? Because they sort of go together, right? I have so many favorites, and I, I, I definitely fought very hard for those backstories because they were very expensive to shoot. Um, going to to a new location that you were never are going to return to again is always a very expensive proposition. But I thought it was so important to get the backstories into the show because they inform who the characters are. I, I think my absolute Number one favorite is um, Luffy and Shanks and the story of how he got that straw hat. And episode two is very much about that that straw hat moment and how important the hat is to Luffy in the present day and in, in the the adult version of Luffy. And then the story of how he got the hat, uh, which is really taken uh, in some places frame by frame uh, from the manga yeah, uh, yeah. as far as reproducing that. And it's not a coincidence that I think last year was the 25th anniversary and the yeah. logo that uh, Oda, I guess, chose for 
the 25th anniversary is that exact frame of Shanks putting the hat. It's a wonderful frame, and and I was so happy that the actors uh, really, really nailed it. It's it it's it it tears me up every time I see it, and I hope people feel the same way. You said that you familiarize uh, yourself with the source material, of course. Uh, is there something uh, specific that, however, from that source material that you regret uh, not putting into the show, either due to runtime constraints or because it was simply not adaptable to live TV? Uh, yes. Um, and I don't want to uh, kind of give a spoiler here. Is this going to run after the show airs? Technically, yes. Technically, yes. Um, the it's, biggest not, it's not being... cut, it. no, no worries. Okay. <laughs> the biggest one for me that we didn't get to do was Logetown. Um, uh, in, in present day. And we needed two more episodes to, to be able to do Logetown. And there wasn't the budget, there wasn't the screen time, and there wasn't room in the eight episodes to do it in, in the way that it deserved to be done. And so we see Logetown in the um, in the very early going in Gold Rogers execution. And then, of course, you know, uh, uh, wanted to come back to Logetown and just couldn't fit it in the eight episodes. It felt like we were rushing and it was also a very expensive build. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, re a regret for sure. It's fair, I think, to say that you and Matt Owen set out to do the impossible with this project. <laughs> now that it's done, now that you've done the impossible and you can look back, uh, what were some of the hardest moments in this journey? I think the hardest part was getting the scripts right, um, getting them right for Netflix, getting them right for Odesan, getting them right for us. Um, and it was it was definitely a journey in trying to it's that balance trying to figure out how much um, fan service to pay where to make changes are those changes going to be okay and how to keep alive the emotional content of those scenes so that even if a scene is not exactly as it was in the manga you still feel the same emotion mm -hmm. that you felt when you first read it whether that's you cry you laugh you're excited thrilled um scared the whole point was to try to bring up that emotion. And even if something wasn't a one-to-one, -one, um, that was, that was a huge challenge. And then of course the production was, uh, you know, I spent a year in Cape town um, shooting the show, both in the, the pre-production phase and the production phase. And so it was being on set every single day for the better part of a year to make sure that the show got done right based on our experiences with the material um and that's not to say that emma and the other directors didn't have you know huge say they're directing the episodes but it was so helpful to be on set to be able to say oh wait wait a second there's a moment here that i think that we can add to or take away from or hey let's not show that because of this reason uh that ability to be on set was priceless and really enabled uh me to have a level of control that normally I wouldn't have. I wouldn't be able to be on set with the show the entire time. You obviously, and by you I mean all the showrunners, you must have kept in mind the hard lessons learned by previous live action adaptations of anime, such as Cowboy Beagle, Death Note. So how did you try to be different from these shows and what's the recipe that you found and applied to your show? I think that the whole thing about, um, uh, you know, there's never been a successful anime adaptation is a little overblown. It's true. And yet at the same time, those were all different people who were working on those shows. It really wasn't like it was the same group failing again and again and again. Um, so I think we just had to have the courage to say, hey, you know what, this one's going to be different. Um, and if we pay the right attention, the right amount of attention to um, to the fan base, and to uh, uh, keeping those Easter egg moments alive and really giving people a lot of the texture of, of the One Piece manga and, and, and some of the anime as well, then we will be forgiven the new stuff that's added. And I certainly hope that's the case um, because, again, we ne never set out to do a one-to-one, -one, but wanted to be very faithful to the source material. And at the same time, tell a story that was never intended to be told when Oda San first wrote the manga, which is an eight episode TV season that has to have its own kind of rise and fall. And that the manga was never structured that way. So of course it's not gonna have that. So it was finding what are those kind of emotional points and bookends and signposts to be able to kind of direct you through an episode, a season rather of television. You said something interesting here because the manga of course was uh, and is uh, created 
on a weekly release schedule with that in mind, right? So do you think that uh, this adaptation would have worked better in a previous era of TV where uh, TV shows that they're weekly, of course you worked on Lost, just to mention one. Yeah. Do you think that One Piece would have worked better in that frame with weekly episodes airing every week? My personal opinion is absolutely. I love weekly drops of shows. I love the the way to be able to um, to to have the anticipation build week to week, especially in a show that you really love from the beginning. You're so then looking forward to the next week and the next week after that. And there's something I, I go crazy over shows that I that I really like, and the episodes aren't out yet, and I have to wait. That being said, Netflix is Netflix and they're doing their thing um, and it's been very successful for them. Um, do I wish that it was being shown on a weekly? Absolutely. As you mentioned, you must have had some fair amount of interaction with uh, Eiichiro Oda. Uh, what's the most important thing that you learned from him during this project? I would say um, uh, just trying to figure out the amount of the amount of fealty and loyalty uh, uh, that that had to be uh, given to the manga. And initially, um, look, sometimes when something is adapted, it's it's very, very faithful. And sometimes it's a, a radical difference where it's just you take the idea and you run with it in a completely different direction. Both types of shows can be successful. With this one, it was clear as we were talking about it that getting too far away from the source material was not going to be good in any way. Sure, there were wonderful stories that could be told that were not as close to the manga, but I think that that rightfully so, the fan base would not have accepted those shows because One Piece is such a beloved piece of material. And so I really wanted to, after a lot of trial and error, really wanted to uh, honor what Oda-san w- wanted to do, which was to have a version of the show that that we felt really good about it, that he felt really good about. It. And so it was then a matter of, again, lining those things up and kind of toggling them a little left and a little right and just making sure that that line was was coming through that felt, even if there's something new in the show, I pray to God, it feels like the show because that was the intent. Is there one uh, funny older story you can share with us, maybe from his visit to the set or from your personal interactions? You know what? He's a really interesting man, um, very challenging, very uh, opinionated, and rightfully so. Uh, he's a genius, and he created a, a wonderful, wonderful world. Uh, it is, it is. I've, I've always said this, this is his sandbox, and we just get to play in it, and it's a, a privilege uh, to do so. Um, funny stories. Um, I don't know that there's a funny story as much as um, it was always uh, daunting to uh, to sit with him or to talk with him on on Zooms um, because he is the creator of the world. Uh, and so it, it definitely uh, felt like there was a huge responsibility that was being handed over. Uh, and uh, I very much wanted to honor that responsibility at the same time as tell a great ep- a great season of television. What you have adopted in the manga is called the East Blue arc because it's all yep. set in the East Blue Sea. And personally, I think that's perhaps the most grounded part of the One Piece story, right? So once the uh, Straw Hats move to the Grand Line, which is their main objective, the main goal in season one, well then, you know, because you've been reading the manga, there is a lot more crazy stuff, right? Oh, yeah. No spoilers here, but island in the sky, island underwater, damage with powers at every corner, right? So you think that it will be possible to adapt all of that in the future season, or is it simply too much for a live TV show? I think that One Piece particularly is going to be very difficult to adapt everything, uh, the, to, to really do the story justice and hit every single uh, kind of moment and location and antagonist. Uh, I think will be very, very difficult just by virtue of the sheer size and scope of it, not to mention how long it takes to shoot. I mean, it took it took us uh, a year of shooting after uh, two years of working on story and scripts. And so I think that process could certainly be streamlined. But at the same time, it takes a long time. So, you know, I can't speak to to spoilers and to you know, future plans. But, um, yeah, it's 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 a challenge. If there was one thing that you could say to every person in the world who is about to start watching the show for the first time, what would that be? I would say to uh, 
to jump into it with with no expectation, to watch the show for what it is and just let the world come to you uh, because it is so unique and so different from most of the other big epic fantasy shows out there. I think you just have to accept it. I think you have to, I would tell people to uh, enjoy the tone of the show because the show is fun and sometimes a little bit goofy and irreverent, but also very emotional and very heartfelt. And at the core of it is a story about following your dreams, which is something that we all struggle with. Um, uh, And and it's, it's a, it's a, I, I have always said, even four years ago, that this was a wonderful story for the times we're in because it's about hope and optimism and following dreams, which is something that is in scarce supply these days.